This episode of the Mike on Much podcast is in partnership with Jameson. Good things come in threes. Yeah, because you uh, delivered donuts to Arkells in the studio, like a yeah. true gentleman. Yeah. Well, oh no, I think I brought you cupcakes from oh, Baker cupcakes. Bots. That's right. Yeah, yeah because uh, yeah, I just feel like when you bring a sweet treat to a, some sort of proceedings, it always enlivens things a little bit. You know. <laughs> Listen, I have a sugar tooth of a seven-year-old boy, so right. So I'm these very are still into warm too. Yeah, they, these, they she just made them. You guys should definitely dive in. I'm getting at least that. have one. So, I mean, if you're listening, uh, Jay Unright has brought donuts to our podcast. We're, we're yeah. just rolling. We're just jumping into this thing. We're jumping right in. Um, well, let's, let, let's start it properly now that we have the donuts. Thanks, Jay, for the donuts. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. You're welcome. Little Nicky's is a good, a good spot. Like, uh, it's been there for quite a long time, mm-hmm. I think. This is a kind of a classic downtown institution. And they've kind of been known for these little, do- you know, what a smart thing for them to do rather than just open a coffee shop. They said, we could wrap our heads around making these little donuts fresh and that could be our hook. That could be our thing. So when I think of Little Nicky's, I think of these donuts and therefore I bring you these donuts. <laughs> That's a smart business play for a small <laughs> independent business. I it's think. very good. Small yeah. business, big sign. Mm, I feel like sign. it yeah. says Little Nicky's very largely on the side of that building. That's true. Yeah, mm-hmm. that nice mural. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever wanted to be like a... Uh, one of the people on Dragon's Den or something. It feels like you <laughs> yeah, have a lot I'd of like, ideas. <laughs> I'd love to. I don't know if I have the net worth to to qualify, but uh, I would love to. <laughs> it do would be hilarious like to front like you had the net worth <laughs> and be a judge on that show. And yeah. then, but why does he keep turning down business opportunities? Because <laughs> you do not have the money to support it whatsoever. <laughs> He's like, really tough. It. I'm out though. <laughs> <laughs> that dragon is so tough. Like, this one know. seems like a real home run. <laughs> yet he's still not going. For it. <laughs> <laughs> he just you had every. I'm out. I'm out. I'm sorry. I'm out. <laughs> well, welcome to the Mike Much podcast. To our listeners, uh, I'm your host, Mike Veerman. We are here, as always, with our friend and producer, Max Kerman. We are here with the pop culture aficionado, Shane Christian Cunningham. We have intern Erica on the dials. And we also have a very special guest, as you've been listening to, uh, joining us today. Author, podcaster, sports anchor, the co-host of Sports Center with Jay and Dan. Jay and Wright. Jay, I've already said thanks for coming on, but... It's great to be here again. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a bit of a special episode for us because we're going to talk a bit about your career, and then we're going to do some topics at the end because that's what we do on this show. I uh, sent him topics I about like twenty it. minutes Max prepped ago. You. We didn't know if I'm we were ready. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, I've well, got, got my head around it. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're like, will, will he be okay if we just like? Throw? I'm like, he doesn't care. He's oh, fine. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I would have been fine with that too. But I, but I do appreciate that you, you know, the first topic especially is near and dear to my heart. So you guys couldn't have. Oh, Put like the better. three-day work week? Yes. yes okay, we'll get absolutely. To that. We're all about shortening listeners. our work week mm. at Sports Center with Jane Day. <laughs> but when I got you from the elevators, you said you have just woken up. Because we have three new dads. Well, you're not the newest dad. You, no. you have a four-year-old. I have a four-year-old, and then I have an 11-month-old. 11 months. Oh, you yeah. guys. And one year. One year. Oh, so we could do we, play dates. Mike. Yeah. Yeah, 18 yeah. months. 18 months. Wow, we could have three-way play dates. Mm-hmm. We're all in the pocket here. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys what did you guys have? A little boy, girl? Girl. Girl. Bald girl, yeah. Bald girl. <laughs> girl full head of hair. Okay. Came out with a mom. It's a boy, contentious boy full head of hair. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, uh and your partner is Chinese originally? Uh, she's Chinese yeah, Canadian? she's Chinese and uh Chobi is her name. Chobi, which and is she's a former Indian Indian name. Mm. Uh her dad grew up in um Calcutta, actually. Wow. So uh my understanding of it, and I apologize if I don't get this quite right, a lot of uh, after the Second World War, a lot of Southern Chinese fled to India, mm-hmm. and so he, her dad, grew up in India. And uh, does he speak sh- Indian? Uh, uh, he does. He oh, does wow. speak uh, Bengali, or he did. He passed away a few years ago, and um, so he, um, Chobi is a Bengali word which means a uh, picture, mm. and so he named uh, her. Uh, you know, beautiful picture was sort of his idea. And uh, I knew, the funny thing about him is that <laughs> we'd go to their house at New Year's and he would make um, like all Indian food. Like in his mind, I think he was Indian. You know? <laughs> he had totally so become a part of that right, culture. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, like he grew up there, literally, yeah. right? He went there when he was really young and he grew up there. So I think in his mind, he thought that way. He spoke the language. Um, 
Uh, I do not speak the language. But yeah, and neither does does my wife, actually, which I'm always a little disappointed in her for that. How much but, of that are you uh, trying to pass on to your children? Zero. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we just want her to get through French immersion. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big conversation. Do you do the French immersion? Shane and I have had that conversation. Really? Yeah. Yeah? Are you guys going to do it? He's pro. I'm against it. I'm doing it. it. Shane's out. How come yeah. you're against it, Shane? Just because I feel like for me, school was hard enough with right. just English. Right. <laughs> and if you throw another language in, I feel like it's going to add a layer of confusion. That's fair. And it's going to make her fall behind in school if the apple doesn't fall far. Right. If she doesn't have a, uh, uh, you know, a thing for language early on or whatever. And why are you doing it, Mike? Let's throw as much as we can at her and see what she can take. Yeah, I agree. Well, for me, it's that. Uh, I bought a house a half a block from a French immersion school. So sorry, kids, you're taking French immersion. See, the thing Makes why the French immersion pisses me off is that all my friends. <laughs> I don't know if anybody had gone there. Well, that, that was pretty aggressive. <laughs> well, I sort of the inverse of your situation is that my friends who wanted to get out of, well, their parents wanted to get them out of sending them to the local public school, right? And because they thought the French immersion school, which was in a slightly better neighborhood, Palmerston was the French immersion right, school, right? And so that was their excuse to get them out of the neighborhood school, which yeah. I think is bullshit because that's actually a real issue uh, for young families in Hamilton where they don't want to go to the school with like the new immigrants in a s- lower eco- social and economic area. Right. And they just go, oh, but we're interested in French immersion and then they boot them off to the, the so fancy area. Yeah. It's an elitist it move. It kind of, you know, they call it the, uh, I think they call French immersion the uh, private school, the public schools. That's, isn't that yeah. the, <laughs> that's right. Isn't that the, the word they use or the term they use? But you just happen to live near a private Well, a, a, and, a, and a to school. be honest, my, my wife, who we were just discussing, did take French immersion mm-hmm. and is fluent and... I that was my only regret about school. I grew up in a very small prairie town. We didn't have we didn't even have a second school. We had one school. It was like there's your school you're going to. So there was no Catholic. There was no Catholic school. There was not. It was a town of two thousand people. So there was one school and that was it. And you just went, a desk in a field. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was and it was you and and the farmers and um, you went to school with the same kids from kindergarten to grade twelve. You know, I graduated with seventy people and they were the same. You know, people I went to school with when I was a little kid, but there was no French immersion. And I always regretted not learning French, you know, and this I just regretted not learning one other language. And I only regret it. And I wonder, if Max, if you feel this way when you're in Europe mm. and you run into people your age and they speak like four or five mm. languages yeah. fluently. And you're like, I don't even speak one other language. And I'm in a country that is bilingual. Mm-hmm. Like That's kind of sad in a way. Yeah. Is French so. immersion known to stick, though? Or does well, it just it, fall off? I think it depends. You, I think with everything you have to keep up with it. But I think with French immersion, like my wife doesn't speak it, doesn't listen to French, you know, Radio Canada or anything like that. She doesn't really keep up with it. But at work, if someone's needed to translate something or she can write it, she mm-hmm. can read it uh, and she can speak it. So I think, yeah, I think if you if you stick with it all the way through through school, it'll, it'll stick like anything. But um, but also to your point, Shane. I don't think it's for everybody. Like I've noticed a lot of uh, the parents that go to school with my daughter who have kids in older grades, some of them have pulled them, pulled their kids out of it because I think it's, I think it can be tough. Yeah. You know, I think for a lot of kids, I don't think every kid is, I'm definitely not a kid who is great with languages and I don't think it's for every kid. So uh, yeah, I think, I think it's every parent's choice, but, but I do like it. The concept of almost by osmosis, your kid, mm. you know, mm-hmm. learning to, learning another language. Well, they don't even know that they're working at it at that point. Pretty much, right? And when they're that young. I, well, I found, because my parents didn't have any sort of uh, forethought about what I was going to do, so it's like they would never have thought to put me in a French immersion. They never got me like a piano lesson. Like, I'm like, I wish that they made me do everything, and then you can kind of choose to get rid of what you don't want. So but don't you think like, that's what's great about growing up in the city, is there's so many yes. things that you could you yeah. could do as a kid. And Max, like, you grew up in the city. Like, mm-hmm. did your parents put you in a million different things and then you decided no I want to do music or uh, yeah I, I played a lot of sports played at Christy Pitts that was my, where I played baseball and basketball at uh, Bigford uh, Bob Bate Community Center across from Christy Pitts uh, I took some gymnastics actually oh. can, can you still flip it? yeah no because I hated swimming lessons so much oh. I failed I failed aqua across 11 like four times <laughs> did yeah. you can you shame. swim now I can swim now I can, okay, I can get around but anyway this, let's get back to uh, yeah, well, let me, the Jay origin just ask you one yeah. question do you guys have <laughs> friends your age who can't swim mm. I do not that I'm aware of but maybe they haven't shared it I haven't swam with all my friends mm. so right. maybe the situation <laughs> hasn't <laughs> presented itself why do you well you, have you ever like because I've gone to cottages with friends like from <laughs> college right and all of a sudden one of them would be like well I'm not coming out on that boat I can't swim and I'll just be like 
guys, we're we're in our forties. Like you, <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous, right? Like yeah. it's dangerous. I I had a friend in high school, not to get too dark, but I had a friend in high school drown because he we were out at a lake and he you know waded in and he couldn't swim. Like wow. it's dangerous to yeah. not be. So yeah, I always think about that. You know, like it's a life skill you need. It's a life skill. You have to learn yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, riding a bike, that's a weird one when, when adults my age can't ride a bike. Can you ride a bike? What? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> really? Have you, an adult, you know? There's a few of them out there. I can't think of it. The this top can't of my head. ride a bike? Yeah, I never wow. learned. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. That would almost be a good TV show, like to get a group of <laughs> a group of adults who couldn't ride a bike and teach them to ride a bike. Yeah, like adult <laughs> learning or like something. Canada's and... worst driver, but it's all bicycles. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned uh, growing up in a small town. What I'm always fascinated by is when people go into uh, broadcasting. Is that something that you were like, was it a big TV home? Were you like, oh, I love watching sort of either sports highlights or just SNL? Like, you know, because obviously comedy is a big part of what um, you and Dan do. How much were you sort of focused on that growing up and then saw that as sort of an end goal for a career? Yeah, very uh, two main influences for me. Um, David Letterman, uh, the late night show, the yeah. NBC show. The twelve thirty show was the biggest influence in my life. It was kind of it kind of came to prominence and popularity when I was in junior high, and so I would record it at night on my VCR and then race home after school and watch it. And it was like a a door had opened for me in so many ways because all the late night talk shows and daytime talk shows to that point were so slick and polished. The hosts were so slick and polished. Everything was very by the book. And Letterman peeled the curtain back on television period right sent his stage hand to do comedy bits you know basically was uncomfortable and awkward on television and it worked you know it was it was a real revelation and it was such a popular show and then on the other side of it um shows like nfl prime time and sports desk and stuff highlight shows i was like max i was out playing sports i didn't have a lot of time to watch stuff so i loved highlight shows and those guys always seemed like they were having so much fun yeah. and uh, more fun than other people on television. So that was very you know, appealing to me. But my parents also owned the local drugstore in town, and it was a lucrative business, and I was lazy, and it seemed like <laughs> a good idea to maybe just do that. I read that the pharmacy was your path. Yeah, that was what I was you were there. going to do. I was there. I was at University of Alberta, and I was, I, I was enrolled, and I was ready to go, and then I just kind of did a 180 and realized, like, I can't. Like my dad always says, you're counting pills all day. And that's, he, he hated it, you know. And so so he he was very, I don't think he was uh, too disappointed when I decided to turn the back on pharmacy and go into broadcasting. You know, it's, it, it's interesting because everybody grows up watching people on TV, but there's kind of a moment where you go, like, how do I make that into a career? You know, is it something where you thought, I'm going to go to school and, and then radio broadcasting and then get a job? Did Were you able to sort of conceptualize of it as a career or did it always seem like an abstract thing? It was, I wasn't. And that's why I think I went into pharmacy first because yeah. it just seemed like too much of a pie in the sky, you know, pipe dream that I could ever actually do this. Plus coming from the prairies, I think, in a small town in the prairies, it seemed daunting. You know, being a much music VJ seemed like, my God, that's the pinnacle you know there's like steve star. anthony right yeah like <laughs> my goodness you know uh, michael williams and erica am that those are the stars of the day to me they really were i mean it was it seemed like they were having so much fun but it seemed like an impossible thing i thought literally thousands and thousands of people across the country must want to do this and there's no way i could possibly get into it but i ended up reading a book called what color is your parachute <laughs> which i believe is still in existence today and it's sort of a book that teaches you um it basically helps you decide what you want to do with your life. And one of the uh, premises of this book is if there's something you want to do, if you literally want to be a rock star, then reach out to Max Kerman and see if you can sit down with Max for five minutes and talk to him. Like talk to someone in that profession and see what it's really like because you might not want to do that after mm -hmm. talking to that person. So I reached Specifically out... Specifically Max. Most people... Well, mostly would, Max. Yeah. <laughs> He's the one who would really turn you off of it. But, I'm yeah. going to go into pharmaceuticals after <laughs> speaking right. with Max. Yeah. Suddenly a lot of pharmacists <laughs> coming out of... But yeah, I, I spoke to a young producer named Pat Kiernan at Global in Edmonton. And he was very kind. He just said, listen, I can't pay you. This is the theme of all Canadian broadcasting. I can't pay you, but come on in and volunteer. And... Um, so, right, yeah. So, I could just giggle about right, She gave yeah. me a knowing nod. So, <laughs> we've got interns too. So, yeah, so I went and I volunteered. I wasn't even in broadcasting yet, but I volunteered at Global in Edmonton for a couple of years and um, 
and just kind of learned the business and was around people in the business and it instantly fell in love with it. And that sort of set me on the path. Was there someone in that office that goes, oh, that person's having fun and seems to work really hard? Because that's been the signature of, of your career. It feels like you work your ass off, but you also have a great time. Was there anybody who you sort of observed, if that not if not in that office somewhere else, that you're like, oh, that's kind of what would seem like a good time? That's no, going to be my mentor. Yeah. yeah, well, it's a great question. In fact, so the, growing up, much like kids in, in this area grew up in Jim Taddy and Mark Hebsher were their heroes, mm. so they were on Sportsline on Global. In Edmonton, it was Darren Detition, who's now on TSN. <laughs> Dutchie? Dutchie <laughs> was, was from Edmonton, yeah. And Dutchie was in that newsroom, and whatever you think Dutchie was doing, he was doing. He was doing, he was just having, he was like the jock in the classroom, just making everybody laugh and throwing the football Was he as and, fit then? Not as jacked. Right, because Definitely he's not big. as jacked. Yeah, now he's <laughs> jacked fit. Uh, he was fit, but not, he didn't hit the gym quite that hard. <laughs> well, okay, just for our listeners, I've met Dutchie maybe twice, and if you think he's like a ball of energy on television, off air, he's about 10 times that. Yeah. It is insane. Yeah, like, I met him one time, and then, he was going like a mile a minute and just like talking about what he was doing on Saturday night. He was talking about going to a party. He was talking like he was just he was using, but then I got to hit the gym. Like he was like talking about it all. Yeah, he's that was that's been him his whole life and um, kind of a larger than life personality. At the time, he had a mullet like he was full on <laughs> full on prairies, you know, and, and ironically or he really. Had no, a it was full. It was it was real. We kept the mullets going longer than the ironic. You know, wow. time period How long would allow. Did, did you? Rock I had. One? I was rocking one at least until until ninety one. Nice. <laughs> I definitely had it from like eighty seven to ninety one. I had a full on mullet, like full, like real, like flow in the front, but you know, then of course in the back, really rich, and I have curly hair, so. <laughs> It was ugly, but you know, looking back at it, it, I look back at pictures of my whole class. Everybody had, had yeah. Them. But yeah. at the time, you thought it looked good. Well, everybody—that's what everyone had. Right. Yeah. Hell, I mean, Wayne Gretzky absolutely. had one, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. A little bit of that flow, right? Yeah, yeah, back those the, Oilers the teams had the, the flow. Yeah, yeah for Hockey sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess like the other thing is, so you end up getting the the gig on air. How do you make the transition from like you said, sort of uh, being in global, not getting paid anything, uh, to then getting on air? Because that's Eric is asking this question. A lot of people, it's right? Hard <laughs> it's hard to make the transition, right? Because there's either people blocking you, or they're they're not invested in somebody else taking a gig. Hundred percent. And uh, and the thing with someone like Erica who's starting now, it's different now because back then. Uh, TV was still the only thing, you know. I mean, I'm that old that the internet wasn't really up and running to a significant degree in terms of streaming and things like that at that time. So there were a lot of small television stations across the country that you could go and work at and really work out the kinks. So um, I was lucky enough to go to Saskatoon. A lot of my friends went to way smaller towns, the the Lloyd Minsters and and Medicine Hats of the world. I I got to Saskatoon and... um, And had a year where I just essentially got to work out the kinks, and it was great. And I was also lucky because Sportsnet launched that year. So a lot of guys who had been working in, say, the Saskatoons of the world for like a decade were suddenly being called to Toronto to Mm. to come. They're all getting plucked. What year was that? Yeah, that would have been 98. Mm. So I was very lucky because all of a sudden there was a lot of jobs out there that I could that I could snag so uh so yeah I had a lot of luck along the way for sure how, how cognizant were you of things that you wanted to improve on like because like if, if you're talking to a musician you're like oh you know I gotta improve my chops on guitar or yeah. I, maybe I need to take some vocal lessons like how much self-monitoring did you do a lot like, did you watch a lot of game tape of yourself I a little bit but it was more that after a year at global I decided I gotta branch out a bit because I didn't think it would be good for me to just be in sports for my entire career. So I actually applied to the breakfast. Te- they were launching breakfast television in Winnipeg. And I, I think applied we've seen and I got clips it. of that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I applied and I got it. And, uh, and were it you was like, like the, the Kevin Frankish. I was the, the I was more like the Ann Romer. The, gotcha. Right. Like the uh, Dina Pugliese. Like I was the host, the, the host yeah. of the whole show. And um, it was an amazing education because I went from a half hour show that was scripted and heavily edited to a three-hour live show, no script, eight interview segments a show, a band every show, because we're in Winnipeg, so there's like a thousand bands, and we would have local bands on every every morning, a different local band. I used to ask like musicians, they're like, why are there so, like Neil Young and the Weaker Thans and, and all these amazing bands come from, from Winnipeg, like why is that? And they're like, well, it's cold 10 months of the year, and we do a lot of drugs and play instruments. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, that makes sense. I get it now. But it was an amazing education because to your point, Max, like I was in my mind, I was like, I have to get, I have to be better on my feet. I have to be a better 
uh, reacting. I have to be a better interviewer. Mm. I have to be able, able to chat about stuff spontaneously without thinking about it. And there was no better education than a three-hour morning show where you're half awake. Um, <laughs> you know, there's no better education than that. So it, I did that for two years, and that was that improved what you know as much as I could improve. You know, improved a lot over those two years for sure. Uh, was there ever like a, a moment where you went, "Oh, that went terribly," and actually couldn't shake it? In my first year in Saskatoon, Saskatoon, uh, the University of Saskatchewan is in Saskatoon. They had a really successful football coach named Brian Towers. And two months after I started, UBC tried to lure him away to coach their football team. And it was a big story there. And so they actually put me on the 6 o'clock news to talk about it. And it was my first like live hit. And I think I'd done the nighttime show for a couple of months. So I was feeling way too good about myself. You know, I was like, I got this right. And I go to do this live hit with our news anchor. Who's a good friend of mine to this day. And I just froze. Like I just froze on television at, on the six o'clock news. It was the first story. And I was just like, bleh, 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 like bla- <laughs> babbling and incoherent. And, <laughs> and they quickly wrapped it up and I was just horrified. And I remember I got off, the air and you know the director who's like this grizzled veteran was like you know don't worry about it or whatever but i could tell everyone was like wow is this guy gonna be okay like <laughs> he seemed fine and then we threw him live in our studio like it wasn't like i was out in the field or anything but it was a good wake-up call for me you know first of all it's a testament to you know again trying on air stuff in a smaller community and maybe not making that horrible mistake in front of millions of people across mm-hmm. the country and then the other thing was it was like a wake-up call in the sense like, whoa, you still have a lot of work to do here. Mm. You know, like you you got to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to get Do you remember what you practically did the next day to be like, okay, how do I mentally prepare myself to not do that? I taught – I because I had worked at TSN behind the scenes while I was going to Ryerson. I, I actually called Rod Smith, Jermaine Franklin, some of our reporters there, and I just said I just butchered it. And they were really good. You know, they kind of guided me through it. I think a mistake a lot of young reporters make – when they first try to go live is they try to memorize everything. And I think that's what I tried to do. You can't uh, do that. Cause right? if you can't find it. What do you freeze? Exactly. If you suddenly lose it like an actor, yep. you know, on stage, then, then you're screwed. Whereas if you have your kind of key points that, you know, you have to hit, then you can flow your way around them in a much more natural way. It'll come across more natural. Right. So, but again, I was two months into an, a career and I just didn't know that. So, so again, it was good. It was good though. I'm glad I'm, I'm happy that happened really. Yeah. So you get with uh, with Dan, and it's the one a.m. slot, right? Does it f- At the, we started? It was the two a.m. Two a.m. Okay, yeah, so yeah. you eventually moved up. You graduated to the one a.m. We got to the one eventually. They moved. <laughs> Just us kept to moving one. forward. Yeah, and yeah. that was on that was on TSN. TSN yeah, right? that was on TSN. Did, yeah. did yeah. that feel that uh, would have been two thousand and I think we started in two thousand three. Okay. Yeah. Did that feel like were you friends with Dan before, and they were like, "Let's pair us together because of our chemistry off air," or was it like you're just with this guy, and then it starts to work? A lot, like a lot of things, very random. I so another thing I always tell young people is, so I worked when I was at Breakfast Television. I worked with a news anchor who uh, was just a nightmare. She was just a horrible. <laughs> I was wondering person. if you were going to pull punches <laughs> as you paused and then you just went for it. <laughs> I did a live podcast in Winnipeg this past weekend, and I called her a name that was really bad, and I feel very bad about it. She was very mean. She was just a start mean with a person. B? Let's say that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and she was just, a, you know, just hard to work with, you know. And it was the first time I'd been on air with someone I didn't like. Wow. And it was another great lesson because I eventually just shut down. I just stopped talking to that person. We would have to do promos for the next day's show after the show, and we'd sit in stools next to each other. We wouldn't talk to each other. So the whole crew is standing around and getting ready to shoot. And you, can you imagine that? Like two people, two hosts of the show not speaking to each other. And it was like two years of uncomfortable shows. Two full years. Yeah. And but I on remember, air, did you pull it together? To oh, ta- totally. Yeah. On air, you would never have known. Oh. But I remember after that job was over saying to myself, I will never, no matter how much I dislike someone, I will figure out something about them that I do like. I've got it. I can't. I can't make things uncomfortable for the rest of the crew like that. I can't. I'm making them their job harder. So, um, going back to what you said about Dan, no, I did not know Dan at all. And when I met him and realized that we were very similar people and that we did get along great, I was I was very appreciative of that. I st- I appreciated co-anchors that I got along with more, you know, and and embraced it more uh, from that point forward, knowing 
the nightmare I'd been through. Yeah, it's funny. Like in entertainment, there's like stories where it's like, oh, this person was a was a, was a real pain in the ass to work with. But sometimes pain is beauty, and you have to go through the the fire to fucking make something really beautiful. Like creative but, tension. Creative right. tension. This and is I, the argument for moonlighting, which is a modern reference with Bruce Willis and um, Sybil Shepherd. Thank you very much, Jay. Was this? Ah, don't worry about it, Max. Okay, I'm not a cinephile. Our older like listeners guys. will dig that reference. <laughs> Well, but they, I, they basically had the same uh, situation as Jay was describing. Okay. Well, but but I would say the difference, though, Max. Like I agree with you. If if, if it's a record producer, if Steve, no, Al- no, no, no. Where I'm going with this is, oh. I think that I work way better when I'm having a good time, and right. I and, and I really appreciate the, every conversation. And you're around people that you think are smart, and and you admire them, and it, I just think the product is often better like, yeah. w- when you're just in a healthier, more sort of comforting creative space have you as, not as a, created anything good out of tension uh, occasionally but i can't say it's necessarily better because of the tension or necessary or necessary because creative. of the tension but do you think like i was reading about steve albini last night the mm-hmm. record producer yeah. and, and he's like i was th- like say he said he liked you guys and he wanted to work with you and this is a legendary producer and then you get there and he's kind of a miserable cranky mm-hmm. guy but the end result is a great record. It's a short thing, right? Like they, he recorded in utero in six days. Yeah. So, so it's like a quick thing. Whereas this, where in my business, it's 365. Sure, which right? makes it more important. To it's, it's tougher, I think, mm-hmm. to have that little, maybe that little conflict can work in short mm-hmm. bursts, but I don't know if it works on a television show like this. Yeah, I guess that's more of like a daily grind. Yeah. So you have to get along. But, but I'd also say if, even if you're making a record over the course of a month, I do think that <clears throat> there's more successful producers that actually are good to work with, right. and and it's, and occasionally you'll you'll hear a story about Steve Albini or is Steve Albini known as a hard ass. I don't think so. I okay. think he's just he's just he's, like the nerdiest, smartest guy in the room. Yeah, there are stories of other famous producers that like really rode the band hard, and so, but it's like most of the time. Um, like Bob Rock, I heard was kind of like that. Yeah, I think he can be pretty former difficult. pod guest. Yeah, former really. Yeah, guest. very laid yeah. back interview. But yeah. maybe he could, and yeah, and he uh, he had interesting off mic stories actually that I enjoyed. Well, I just remember that some kind of monster documentary. Mm. Yeah, Metallica. And uh, I think Kirk Hammett or whatever was supposed to hit, you know nail a guitar solo, and <laughs> Bob Rock was just like fucking nail it, dude. You know, like he was like really getting on him, like he wasn't. <laughs> doing it well this he wasn't is, doing it and he was really on him and i was like wow okay this is what it's really like like that's what a producer does like well the of, thing is like those stories are the most memorable and so and so then you get some young person goes who wants to be a producer go maybe i have to be an asshole and right. really ride because that's the one story that sticks out but i'd say 97 percent of the good shit that's come out of the studio is from a producer who's a really good listener who's really encouraging who knows how to guide the band in the right way right because because yeah in our Kel's experience it's like I think most of the time when we have a good time, it's the best material. And I think a lot of bands might say that as well. And like I musicians are like, we got into this so we don't have a boss. <laughs> right. <laughs> so stop yeah, yelling that's at true. me. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, back to the, the Dan um, dynamic, which I find interesting, is you were saying Letterman was this huge influence for you. So there's this comedic element that uh, you bring uh, to the sports highlights, which becomes obviously very successful, and you guys keep moving up hour by hour. Uh, was Dan naturally inclined to sort of uh, like lean comedic like you or did he sort of uh, sort of pick up on your vibe and your leaning how do you guys get there uh i think we just both had we have similar senses of humor and but i don't think anything was planned it happened and like a lot of good things that happened very organically if you would look at the first few shows we did they would probably be really boring to just be straight sort yeah, of very straightforward yeah. like we're just getting through this and seeing where we're at and then over the course of time we started to push it a little bit more and to our boss's credit you know, I had worked behind the scenes at TSN before, so it wasn't like I was this kid from the prairies that they didn't know, and all of a sudden I'm trying to tell jokes on air, and they're like, who the fuck is this <laughs> They knew me. They kind of gave me a little more rope because I, I, I had been there before, and even with that, I would try stuff, and the next day my boss would call and say, eh, dial it back like 15%. And eventually <laughs> we kind of found like a nice happy medium, but it was very organic. Uh, it really happened over the course of a couple of years. So things become very um, successful and popular here. You guys come uh, big names. And then uh, FS1 comes along, Fox in the States. They're starting sort of launching a sort of a rival to an ESPN. Was that the deal yeah, there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So much like you were saying, uh, when Sportsnet started here, they're going to pluck people from the prairies and places yeah. like that. Uh, they came along and they started asking about you guys. 
How do you frame that? Uh, like, do you and Dan, like, obviously they want you guys as a team. Is that a difficult decision? Do you almost get anxiety? Was your contract coming up? Like, I'm always fascinated by sort of like the, uh, the, 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 the sort of impulse to sort of like do right by your employer, but then also maybe benefit yourself by taking a bigger opportunity. How did you frame all of that soup in your mind? Yeah, it's a great question. It was um, our contract, most contracts, broadcasting contracts in this country are such that they're not guaranteed contracts. So you can kind of just quit. And just bolt, and which oh, we wow. did, and um, but conversely, they can also fire you <laughs> and not sure. pay you out, right? So <laughs> how um, am I going to pay my mortgage? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So um, in our case, it was a pretty fascinating story. At the time, so this had been about 2012. BlackBerry uh, Research in Motion was hitting the skids in Kitchener Waterloo, and the Wall Street Journal was doing so many stories about BlackBerry that they sent a reporter from the states to live in Toronto. And that reporter's name was Will Connors. And Will started watching our show and really liked it. And so he contacted TSN PR, happened to be my wife, and said, I want to do a story about these guys and put it in the Wall Street Journal. So there was a story about us in the Wall Street Journal that said, the headline was, why can't we have Canada's sports center? As that story hit the Wall Street Journal, Fox was getting ready to launch FS1. And the president of Fox, Eric Shanks, literally read that story and said, I want I want those guys. Wow. So it's a it's a real, you know, life is pretty random, but that's about Indeed. as random as it gets, right? That's so cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So, so, but it was a long process because, you know, and we learned, it, it should have been a precursor of what's to come, but it started off with them contacting us saying, we want to do it. And then it was an actual year-long process where we wouldn't hear from them forever. And then they get back to me and say, well, we just want you. And we want you for a morning show we're doing. And then they get back to me and say, actually, no, we do want you guys both. So it was all over the map for a year. Finally, a year later, they said, yes, we want you guys. We want to pair you with a panel we have with ex-athletes and do a three-hour-long show, which sounded like a horrible idea to me. <laughs> And when I got to L.A., realized it was a horrible idea and it was a terrible show because it was like two shows in one. And like a lot of things down there, it was exactly the same as up here. The process of making television was the same in terms of our television. The difference was instead of having one producer, we had 12 producers. And I really didn't know who was in charge. And it was 12 mm. different visions. And every, every TV station I've ever worked at, the best ones have always been the ones where it's one person's vision and I understand who's in charge and where the buck stops. Whether I agree with that person all the time or not, doesn't matter. It's always working better if there's one person. That's just the way TV works. At least that's my opinion. Um, at Fox, it was a million. I didn't know who was in charge Too at all. Too many cooks. Too many cooks in the kitchen, absolutely. So, um, But having said that, really fun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> in like living in L.A. and and, you know, Californians, I think, are nicer than Canadians. They're so, um, it's so cliched, but they're so laid back and they're kind and, um, you know, just a lot of hardworking people. Let, met a lot of regular Californians. A lot of our crew are just, you know, regular people, regular families, and um, really enjoy the whole experience. I think it was funny because, you know, the whole experience from a professional perspective was horrible. But from a day-to-day, go-to-work, be-around-people perspective, Lifestyle. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it totally masked the fact that, that from a professional perspective, it wasn't a good, good move at all. Was there any part of you that kind of acquiesced to the Fox people? Because they go, oh, well, they're a big American network. They probably know it's what. Maybe I don't know it's what. Or did- 100%. 100%. At mm-hmm. first, at first yeah. it was like, how could you not, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, well, they brought you down here. You're working on the fo- – you're li- working in Beverly Hills. You're, these people have been doing TV forever. They did the love boat, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah. Um, they've got to know – you know, maybe it's me, right? You're thinking that in your head like, okay, I, this doesn't feel right. Every time I would go home from work, I'd say to my wife, that show felt terrible. I would not watch that show. Mm. It's a horrible feeling, right? It's like putting out a record and yeah. being like, I would not listen to this. Like, yeah. it's terrible. Because I've been in that situation too with, with a one kind of bigger producer who I won't name, who I'm like, oh, well, he says this is cool and his, he did produce this big record, so it doesn't really feel right, but I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, so I'm not going to yeah. say anything. And then after you listen back to the song a few times, you're like, no, it actually just isn't good. Yeah, Dan, yeah. Dan always says the the thing that was strange is that they knew we had been so successful up here, but at no point did they say, all right, what do you guys want to do? What do you guys think we should do? No one ever said that, right? Because, again, it was, I think, 12 guys. And when you have 12 people producing a show, 
everyone wants to stand out in a way. Like the analogy I use is, um, and I want to preface this by saying I like, I love all these people. But when Sportsnet got the hockey contract, right, in 2013, they had Ron McLean under contract. So the smart move would just be to keep the status quo, right? The mm-hmm. smart move would have been to just say, okay, Ron, you're still our host. And, and that brings continuity to the whole proceedings. Like from a viewership perspective, you're like, oh, it's the same show. It's Ron. He's hosting. This is great. But that, but the executives at Sportsnet, that doesn't give them any credit, right? If you maintain the, set, the status quo, then they've done nothing really, right? They don't get credit for it. Whereas if they bring in George Strombolopoulos and it works, then they're geniuses, mm-hmm. Right then, they're then they're really smart, and that always is the way in TV. They'll always switch it up unnecessarily because they're going to get credit for that. Yeah, it's their way to sort of uh, put their their hand put print their stamp on. on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I thought it was fascinating when you talked about that year of um, sort of not knowing if it was going to happen. Is that something where you you tell friends you have to keep it to yourself, or are people aware that it's like this thing might be happening? And then second question: When you say they're going, oh Jay, we just kind of want you and not Dan. Does that put a strain between you and Dan? Yeah, I mean. Sometimes they would just contact me and I wouldn't tell Dan because I thought it was I didn't want to hurt his feelings or say, well, guess what? I'm going and you're not, you know, like that's a horrible that's the one negative thing about being in a kind of partnership work partnership, you know, is that if one person gets opportunities that the others don't, it can be awkward. But it's never really been like that for Dan and I, because usually everything's kind of worked out, whether, you know, if I've done things on my own, he's done things on his own. But going back to your original question, Mike, about that year, yeah, it was it was bizarre because it would. But the good thing about having a whole year to think about it was, in the end, it was like, well, why wouldn't we just go? Like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Um, we're going to go down there, work for four years, make a ton of money, and then just come back and make more money. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sounds pretty good. Very first world problems yeah, I of had course. there. So, so I, I never took it too seriously, you know, and, and, and in the end, like I, I look back on it very fondly, you know, I made great friends down there. It was, you know, the whole thing has been really positive. I feel like you, you were very funny when you came back and you joked about how like Tim Hortons wouldn't sponsor us before, but now they're like shoveling money down our pockets. No, or... it's true. Like, <laughs> like, and that, that's the other thing, you know, going back to what we were originally talking about, about you know, if you want to be on air and you got to go to a small town and stuff, you you need to leave to get respect. You need mm. to leave wherever position you're in to get respect. You have, you have to threaten to leave at the very least because <laughs> otherwise they've got you, right? There's only so many broadcasting outlets in this country. They're yeah. less and less all the time. So all due respect to Bell Media, who we all love and enjoy working for. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, leaving was the best thing we did because then we came back and, like you said, Max, suddenly Tim Hortons wanted to sponsor us and Coors wanted to sponsor <laughs> us, and, and they built us our own studio and we're, you know, we're in our own spot on the lot up there, and it's amazing. Uh, had we stayed, you know, it would have been fine, but we would have been status quo for mm-hmm. sure. Was there any fear that they wouldn't take you back in Canada? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, well, when we left, a uh, little inside baseball, when we left president of Sportsnet at the time, um, who's a former president of TSN, knew the president of Fox. They had worked together before. And I think the president of Fox like approached them and said, can you go talk to those guys and you know, tell them it would be a smart idea for them to take this job? Because we were waffling a bit, right? The, the thing was, we were a little bit older at that point. Dan had kids and and I just got married and and we were going to start a family and I think we were pretty comfortable you know we, we weren't like 20 years old anymore so we were waffling a bit which probably helped us in terms of negotiation a little bit <laughs> but but yeah you know the president of Sportsnet at the time basically said to us if you guys go down there and hate it I'll sign you immediately to a deal right away uh, so then it, then it was sort of like okay well if we don't go we're literal morons now <laughs> right like we have a job waiting for us when we come back um so yeah, so that kind of literally sealed it for us. Like there was no reason not to go at that point. That's so fun. Um, yeah, I mean, and now you guys are back, and uh, it feels like everything worked out for the best. And you kind of like you had this amazing, or maybe not so amazing experience, but an informative experience that uh, I guess makes you sort of. Do you feel like you're more appreciative now of the situation here? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the best part about going to do a show that didn't work was I had four years to. Because they didn't want us to do highlights down there, really. Uh, they wanted essentially a sports talk show. And it was fun. Like, we had great guests. You're literally on the Fox movie lot. So they would just bring movie stars who are promoting films and Fox TV stars in constantly. So we improved our interviewing skills. We did a different style of show. And then by coming back, 
you know, we said to TSN, let's do a, kind of an amalgamation of what the old show was, which was just highlights, and then a little bit of the chat element that we did at Fox. Uh, you know, I think that would be a nice marriage, and it really has turned out to be that way. And I don't know if we would have figured that out had we not gone down there and had all those trials, you know, and yeah. and all that stuff. So, so yeah, it it's nothing but positive now in hindsight because it really has led to a much more enjoyable show that we're doing now. Have we um you have you uh, thought much about because obviously you're very beloved, but some sports fans don't like the goofiness. How do you guys think about that? Yeah, someone just asked me about that yesterday. Like, I think it was Ron McLean who said something like, or maybe it was uh, might have even been Bob Costas. Like someone like just sort of straight, you know, that you think everybody likes. You know, that you think, well, how could you not like Bob Costas? Mm-hmm. You know, he's so just normal. Yeah, but. One of them just said, the second you go on TV, half the people will hate you. Like, the second you go on television, someone's just going to look at you and be like, I can't stand that person. <laughs> and if you, as a young broadcaster, wrap your head around that really quickly, that you can't please everybody, you'll be so much better uh, off, right? And I did that very early on. And I was also very aware that even if I'm just playing it straight, I'm a little weird. And <laughs> people just aren't going to like me. And But the funny thing is, I, you know, with online and social media now, it's tough, I think, for young broadcasters because if, you, if you're thin-skinned, you're going to hear it, right? People behind keyboards or, you know, the keyboard warriors are ha- ha- ready to launch bombs at you in a second. But I've never had a single person, and we go out a lot. Like, if we do live podcasts or we do shows, we're always out after. And we get tons of people coming up to us. And I've never had a single person in 20 years come up to me and say, I don't like you. Mm. I don't like what you do. It's always been positive in person. Yeah. Right? Uh, which is pretty fun. I think it's just more of like a, you know, it's a statement about our society. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Like people aren't willing to go up to people and shit on them. But behind a keyboard, absolutely, they'll, they'll yeah, so launch stay bombs. off of Twitter, young broadcasters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Stay off it early. Or just be comfortable with the fact that you're going to hear a lot of insults and, mm-hmm. and and I think women have it way worse than 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 men do way worse um, and young women who get into the business I think it's way more difficult because then it's a you know it's a whole other side of it for sure Erica I apologize but that's what you're in for <laughs> I, I don't know if I necessarily want an on-camera job I work at MLSE right now with Mike's brother Greg right and um yeah, like to I just have another question about like yours and Dan's dynamic, because um, my me and my roommate really idolize you guys. I'm not gonna lie, you really you you have our dream job. Oh, thanks. It would have been funnier if you said we're not really. We big don't fans. like you. <laughs> For the first time in 20 years, this is where he's been told in person. That's right. Finally, after all these years, it's worked up to this. Um, no, not it's my thing. It's, it's it's two duos actually in the. Uh, TV industry it's you two actually Who? that you and Shane oh, cool. because you guys cool. sit back to back and you've been besties for life and now you work together and you produce mm. which is very cool That's nice. Kate and I think that would be really fun and then That's of course nice. you guys are on TV so oh, thanks. we also talk about that too but um, like how long did it take you to feel comfortable being yourself like on camera and like being funny yeah and, and it's a good question like I think the process of you know going to smaller markets and getting the reps. It's like, I think it's like anything. I'm sure it's like music too. Like reps as a live band, you're probably a thousand times better now, right? Than when you guys started and it's just reps. It's just getting out there and doing it. Yeah. And it's the same with broadcasting. You just got to do it and do it and do it. And, that, and that's, I'm such a, still a proponent, even though there are so many fewer uh, avenues or places that you can do it from, in, from a small market perspective. I just think it's, it's so much better to, get those reps in in a small market i really do um and if it's you know someone you're working with and you want to establish something with them the great thing about things now you know when i was starting you couldn't just do a podcast and suddenly throw it up and suddenly you're you're a podcaster you couldn't do that you can do that now right and so i think that's a brilliant thing you know that you can take control of a little bit of it more you know as a young person at a younger age um, so I would do that. That's what I would do. Yeah. Did you always read the teleprompter kind of with a funny vocal? I was always way? terrified of yeah. the teleprompter, like terrified of making mistakes. To, uh, the So the funny story that, that when we were doing the 2 a.m. show, and that would loop all morning, right? So we'd do it live from 2 to 3 a.m., and then it would loop all morning. When we started, I was so terrified doing on-cams because if I messed up an on-cam at the end of the – at 3 a.m., 
I'd have to redo those on cams. And you could hear the control room. You could hear your crew in your ear like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because they're already there till three in the morning. And, you're, and some of them were vicious about it. Like, fuck you, you know? <laughs> So that's how we came up with, you know, at the end of our show now, we, ha- we list all the things we fucked up on the show because we were so lazy that we were like, <laughs> rather than mi- fix these mistakes, let's just acknowledge them <laughs> and then we can get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> and it turned though. out to be a great segment that people love now. And I think they also love, you know, we embrace the mistakes. I think people like that from us, mm-hmm. um, that we're not trying to make everything so polished and it's a little more natural. That if we have any pet peeves in broadcasting, it's the broadcaster we meet behind the scenes who speaks like a normal person and then appears on television and talks like this. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, dude! Like, it's I I really don't like that type of broadcaster. So we try to avoid that mm-hmm. whole concept. Well, guys, I think it's time to move on to topics. Yeah. Unless anyone in the room has another question, Erica, Jay? do you have any more? We got him here now. Who she, knows? She's a Ryerson student herself, but you're still an intern. Well, I still have the label of intern, but. This is a paid position, Jay, so. <laughs> wow, okay. Are we paying our interns? No. I'm pretty sure we are. Yeah, I think it's the law now. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you want to. No, I, I know a few. I don't think they're paid. <laughs> but I... Oh, I can't get into that. That's a whole other thing. I think that's a generational thing. You were going to say in your day, you just had to work for free. 100%. Yeah, that's what I, I would always say, and then I would get in trouble for I it. know, I feel like... <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like I'm going to get eviscerated now mm-hmm. online. You know what? Yeah, no, I, I, uh, uh, but you know what? Ryerson was a great school. I will say, like, coming here from the prairies, you, um, you're not just thrown into Toronto. You're at Young and Dundas, pre Dundas Square, right? Yeah. yeah. You're talking world, bi- world's biggest jean store and big slice and a million bong shops and Zanzibar. And it's just like you're a kid from the prairies. And they're uh, at night, it's the red light district. And you're like, whoa, like, this is a real eye opener, right? For a kid from the prairies. But I instantly loved it. Like, it, it's still. Weirdly enough, when I'm at, I'm at like, you know, Jarvis and Gerard, like Hooker Harvey's, I'm literally like feeling at home there. You know? <laughs> my people. <laughs> Those are my people. Yeah. Hey, uh, how much uh, work conflict is there uh, with Dan? Is there much like conflict? Yeah. Zero. Wow. That's yeah, so someone nice. asked us about that when we did our live podcast in Winnipeg over the weekend. And we've never had a serious disagreement mm. ever, which... I don't know if that's a healthy thing. That's like a married couple who says we never fight. And you're like, oh, yeah, all right. Um, you probably never have sex either or whatever. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's always, I, I think, again, it goes back to just having had some issues with people I'd worked with previous to that and then realizing you, you met a kindred spirit. Mm. And we are very good, I think. Maybe part of it is we're very good. And I don't know if you guys are like this, where you can sense the other person maybe needs a little space and you just mm. back off. You know, yeah. we're good at that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of PTI and just knowing the chemistry. I feel like the chemistry of hosts is almost the most important thing by far on any television or radio show like that. It's well, like that, if- that show is a great example because that was Eric Rideholm, the producer. Yeah, Singular Vision. Right. Yeah. Seeing those guys in a Washington Post newsroom talk, like arguing about sports and being like, oh, this could be a show. This is it. <laughs> like yeah. this could literally be a show. These two veteran journalists talking and it's still the best version of that format i think because it was so natural right i mean other yeah yeah we call them the yelly shows the shows where everyone yells at each other um other ones are good but that one's the best i think because it it was they were literally plucked out of that newsroom because it was so natural that and uh we love inside the nba with with ernie and and chuck and kenny like the chemistry of those guys well and why do you love that show not because of the analysis but because you love the way those guys are with each other and right nothing like it it's amazing and it's um and i think that's the that's true with tv i think you know podcasts radio if you i always call it the um the world of the show, you know, like our show where we, our stats guy also dresses as a wizard and spins a wheel of destiny when guests come on. Um, that's a, that's a show world that if you're watching our show a lot, you realize it and you start to get into it and you become more attached to it, mm. I think. And um, so I love to establish that kind of thing because I think that that makes you want to watch us more. And, and I, I think that kind of like show world stuff you're talking about which is good for you guys lends itself to the internet really well like you can make yes. lots of jokes and lots of memes and lots of like funny like inside jokes for viewers and listeners yeah and that's an that's another thing like that has changed so much in our business now we have a full-time social media guy yeah. i never know what to call him i feel like that's so 
not degrading, but it's not formal enough. Because he really is, he he takes the show and clips off, you know, parts of it and puts it online and so talented and so smart. And I just call him the social media guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> What about Webmaster? Yeah, that might yeah. be nice. Yeah, Webmaster. The master of web. That. Yeah. Master of web. Yeah, I, well, like, yeah. I like Webmaster. Shout out to our own Webmaster, Webby D. Ooh, his name's Dan. It, we used to be Webmaster Dan, now it's Webby D. Webby D. Yeah. Webmaster is good. Is yeah. that what you guys have always called Dan? Yeah, well, yeah. we'll start as Webmaster Dan, and then Shane started calling him Webby D. Webby D. Yeah. Yeah. Because... And his name's Dan? Yeah. yeah. Our guy's name's Dan. He'll be the, the second. Webby D, the Could second. it be Webby D too? Yeah. Is his last name Crothers? Because our Webby D quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We stole Webby D. <laughs> no. No, this is a different Webby D. Yeah. He is from the Hammer, though. He mm. is from the Hammer. Hey. Right? Yeah. Shane and I, born yeah. and raised. There you go. Yeah. You guys uh, all have that Hamilton connection. This episode of the Mike on Much podcast is supported by Jameson, where good things come in threes. Let me take a moment to talk about the remarkably smooth and unmistakable taste of Jameson. Maybe I'm relaxing in my living room, listening to my favorite record front to back. Or maybe I'm hanging in a pub with friends, having a spirited debate. Or we could be in the middle of recording a podcast right now. Whatever the case may be, I like to have a glass of Jameson in front of me. Jameson ginger and lime or whiskey on the rocks. It all tastes good. Over 200 years of courage, craft, and a collective appreciation for taste in one drink. Jameson, please drink responsibly. Um, let's get on to topics. Yeah, let's do some sure. Quick, so let's we'll do knock it. off some quick topics. Uh, first topic, three-day weekends at Microsoft brings 40% increase in productivity. So the story goes for our listeners, Microsoft's Japanese arm has tried to improve its workers' work-life balance by making weekends a day longer. And it's proved beneficial to the company. Despite workers spending 20% less time in the office, they actually become 39.9% more productive. Not only did productivity go up, but absence was also down by 25%, and the use of electricity went down by nearly the same amount. Who cares about the electricity? That's the company's problem. Uh, but it is funny that absent, uh, like basically your sick or sick mm-hmm. days are just you know, not showing up. Well, my to. wife is a supply teacher, and after a long weekend, nobody calls in sick. So are people just getting sick less? <laughs> no, they feel guilty to call in sick mm. after they've had a good time. I want to say one thing. First of all, you read really well off of, of a laptop. Oh, Thanks, Jim. That was really, really lot. impressive. I appreciate that. Thanks. And um, so when I first started watching The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, he was Monday to Thursday, if you recall. Yes. He took Fridays off. And I remember thinking, man, this is the holy grail right here, <laughs> right? Because Fridays is sort of a dead day in TV in some ways. <laughs> and it just in workplaces in general, like, do you know, you know, Fridays is kind of just a fuck around afternoon, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? It just is. And so there, I love the concept of a four-day work week. Um, but will Thursdays become the new fuck around day? It's possible. It's possible. And then we might have to reduce it to three. Yeah. <laughs> it just keeps going. It never stops. Well, because to, to your point about no one calls in sick after a long weekend, if, they were, if every weekend were long, people would start calling in on that, uh, that Monday. Yeah, yeah eventually. Once quo. they got comfortable, yeah. 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 Uh, but I mean, listen, I think that the novelty of a three day weekend, uh, it would take very long for, I think, that to become sort of, I think we'd be so appreciative for at least a half decade. Mm-hmm. I, I really believe it would work. I, I really do. Yeah, you're right. Half decade, I think a decade, we would have a Maybe. good, solid productivity in this country. And I say we switch to it. I well, think we're all on board. What are other things you do? It's funny, like, all of us don't really have real jobs because there's people that have That's real true. nine to five grinds. That yes. like it's like you guys will call in your boss. You have a great relationship with Randall and be like, I need to do or I need to go fuck off and play basketball mm-hmm. for three hours in the afternoon or come over here and do a podcast. Yeah. I definitely don't have a real job. Your job is very strange. It's not real at all. No, definitely fa- all fake jobs uh, to a degree. Uh, but uh, let's pontificate on this for a second. What are other things you do uh, to make your workers happier and more productive besides, besides for shortening a day? Like, because I always thought the, the concept of having to be at the office for eight thirty or nine. That's tough. I'd like people. There are a lot of people are not morning people and having to wake mm-hmm. up so early. Like if your job was like, I don't know, 11 till eight, would you like that better? Because you have to commute through. I don't In know. Some ways a, it is. Yeah. No, but I'm yeah. saying that you don't. Like you have to wake up at like five thirty to get to tr- to Toronto. Do you still have an right. eight hour work week? Mm, sorry, I, I get day. to work at ten thirty, eleven all the time, and I leave at eight all the time. Okay, is that yeah. better for you than doing nine to five? Yes. Is that just because uh, rush hour stuff? Yeah, and leaving at five doesn't matter because I get home at the same time whether I leave at five or six forty. Doesn't oh, okay. matter. Yeah, and the bus is much quicker if you leave at eight. Like I can get home in forty minutes. 
Do you think you could be as productive in your job if you were from home? If you had like a day at home to work? Hell yeah. It's all about optics at our work though. It's just being – the job is sitting at your desk and being there. See, that's such a – I feel like more and more businesses are going to get smart to that and go, why are we – tormenting Shane and making him come in an extra two days when he doesn't really need to be here. He get an extra hour of sleep. He's available via because email. Because then the bigwigs will be like, oh, no one's at their desk. Must not be a lot of work. Then they'll do more then layoffs. They'll, they'll lay people off. Yeah. Mm. That is the danger, I think. I mean, I love, you know, you're talking about times a day. One of the things I love about my job is that I go in at nine at night and I'm done at one in the morning. I never mm. deal with traffic. And I get things done during the day. I get to come hang out with you guys and do a podcast. <laughs> like it's, I love it. Whereas a lot of people, I think, think that's one of the negative things about the job. When I started, this camera guy, like early on, said, "You'll succeed in this business if you know you'll always be working when everyone else you know is off." Mm. And I was like, "Oh, okay. I got to wrap my head around that. That makes sense." Like literally, holidays, weekends, <laughs> nights, when all normal people with normal jobs are off, that's when I work. Mm-hmm. You know, and when you wrap your head around that, that makes sense. But going back to the productive thing what do you do we just brought in a papa shot into oh, our man. <laughs> that's the dream one of my favorite games so at first i was like this is bad right like mm-hmm. we're gonna be there's gonna be tournaments we're gonna get nothing done the show won't get to air <laughs> but it's amazing like a lot of things it's like anything that's new at first everyone was like oh, it's my turn it's my turn and now after a few weeks you know it goes in waves right a couple people go over and do it everyone else is working then a couple more people go over when they're done their work and it's been an amazing sort of little little breather, you know, mm-hmm. little little thing mm-hmm. in the middle of the day. That everyone can blow off some steam. You shockingly get a good workout from it. You know, you're always <laughs> lifting your arms and stuff. And, well, maybe it's just me because I'm in bad shape. But, <laughs> but anyway, I, I just I was I'm, it's almost like a fun socioeconomic experiment, like bringing in a papa shot to a workplace that's pretty, you know, banal at night. Mm-hmm. And suddenly it's just lit that place up and it's wild times. Yeah, we used to have an arcade machine in our work. Uh, what was the game that Randall had? Uh, or Matt Unsworth brought that in? Yeah, I, I feel like it had uh, all the old Nintendo games on it. You could yes, go it through. did. It yeah. had like 100 games on it. Yeah. But it became like a guilt machine. Like if you were playing it and the boss walked by it and you didn't have your work done, you were in trouble. So you were like, I better get my work done so I can play this game without feeling shame. Right. But maybe guilt. that's a motivator, right? That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. It, was, it worked. It in worked. The, instead of uh, making us less productive, it made us more productive. Interesting. So all we have to do is four-day work weeks <laughs> and bring in Nintendo games. I think three shots. can work perfectly well. I agree. Well. I yeah. agree. Three-day work weeks. Unless you're digging ditches or something that's very, like, hands Like, isn't practical. all of Europe, guys, isn't all of Europe... They just generally take more vacation than we do. Yeah, right. That's what I've always heard. Well, I and saw so, that Michael Moore or someone did a documentary that I saw about it, but it made it seem like the quality of life is much higher. Right. Over there. It's all about quality of life, mm-hmm. I think, and um, and I do think we, in general, in North America, work way too hard, and in this city especially. Like, yeah, I guess the question also is like, can you trust your employees? If you give them all the liberty in the world, will they do a good job for you? And yeah, and I think. There's even companies in Toronto here that go, you can have as many sick days or vacation days as you want as long as the work gets done. I think there is a shift, especially with some of the tech companies. Uh, I think I have a friend that works at Freshy, and there's like no such that, that you can literally vacation as much as you want. Really? Yeah. Wow. And so they don't monitor it, but I guess there's probably a high expectation for getting the work done and, and abiding by that company's culture in other ways. I love it. Yeah. but I, But I do like the idea of... The more sort of responsibility you give to people, the more they'll rise to the occasion. I like to think that's true. I know it's not always true, and I know that sometimes you do need to put like harsher rules in place. But I think there's something something you said about like just more freedom for employees. As long as you hire the right kind of people, they're going to want to do a good job. Yeah, and I think it depends on the workplace too. Yeah, you know, I you know a a company, a forward thinking company like Freshy, you know, Mm -hmm. might be different than (laughs) than a factory. Yeah, than a factory. (laughs) Can you imagine a steel factory that nobody showed up? That's right. (laughs) That's right. Got made. Didn't fill that yeah. order today. Oh, auto people are happy. <laughs> <laughs> now no they'll come around. <laughs> if it's a four day work week, does it still uh, 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 main? Uh, does it still continue to be a five day school week? Mm. It's a good question because I find that f- that Friday, man, they're mm. burned out. They're mm. done. Mm-hmm. But we did it. Yeah, I say so yes. get to school. Kid. Yes, yeah. so you get you get the Friday. Without the kid. Well, yeah, then the parents get off, and then it's a good motivating thing for the kids to want to get in the workforce. (laughs) 
Skip college. Yeah. <laughs> get to the four day work week. <laughs> I think we got to get to the four day work week first, and then we can talk about the school. Then we'll yeah. worry about the children. Yeah. All right. Uh, the last thing on yep. that note: What's your uh, daily schedule? So you work from nine to one or two. And nine to you- one, and then I get home and I will listen to music till about two thirty in the morning. Then I'll sleep till about. Hold on. Do you just have your headphones on, eyes closed, or are you like on your computer? I have uh, I have my head I have a really nice set of headphones uh, attached to a uh, record player and I listen to records. Are and you on your phone or is it just like sometimes just, on my it? phone, sometimes flipping through books, mm. but mostly uh, mostly just yeah mostly on my phone. Okay, and then I get up at about six thirty seven with my daughter, and then I get her off to school at nine. Then I sleep till noon mm. after I drop her off, and then uh, the rest of the day is all over the place. Maybe I have lunch with Max Kerman. Maybe I come do the Mike on Much podcast. <laughs> maybe I maybe my wife goes and works out, and I stay home with our eleven month old, and we watch uh, Peppa Pig and Wiggles. It's all over the place. It's wild. It's unpredictable. It's a real thrill ride. Let's say you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you are off on a weekend. Have you grown to like dislike normies? A little bit. Yeah. A little. I know what you're saying. Like, uh, first of all, I can't do. I can't run errands on a weekend, mm-hmm. right? When when it's way busier and stuff. I'm like, what? I wasted it. I had all these days free where I could have done done this. This is the benefit of working nights that yeah. you don't have to do that on the weekend. And then, um, but other than that. I'm I'm just happy when I do have nights off. Like the only problem with coming back and having our names on the show now is that if there's like a concert on a Tuesday, in the past when I was just doing Sports Center, I could switch with like Jennifer Hedger or something because mm-hmm. my name wasn't attached to the show. Now I can't do that. So I can't right. I, I can only go see concerts on Fridays mm-hmm. and Saturdays. So it kind of limits you. But again, first world problems. <laughs> and they can't switch out the sign to be like Jennifer Hedger. That's the problem. Yeah, right. it's permanent. Do you guys yeah. ever have fill-ins though? On days we like- do, we do. It was funny. The first year we just shut the show down for a, mm-hmm. for a month, and then Tim Hortons, I guess, halfway through the time, <laughs> no was bueno. like, "Where are you guys?" <laughs> and we're like, "We have to take vacation." <laughs> and they're like, uh, "How about one of you take vacation, and then the other one take vacation?" Does the fill-in have to have the same name as the person? <laughs> <laughs> it Is would, there another jail really company convenient. that can be on air? <laughs> it would it'd be very convenient, but uh, no, no. It was it, interestingly enough. Uh, I had Dan had five weeks vacation in the summer, and I had five different a different fill in every week, and they were all women, mm-hmm. and it was really fun, like because it was all over the map, right? And they were doing a much different show than what they normally do, uh, you know, more kind of relaxed and stuff, and so they were all really into it. You know, they really enjoyed it. Um, and conversely, I enjoyed it. So I, I really enjoy working with Dan. But you know, once in a while, to switch it up, then, yeah, you know, it's pretty nice. Do you, when you were on vacation, did you watch your fill-ins? No, right. I I don't watch any other. Like I, I'm like Max. I like inside the NBA and stuff like that. But I don't watch the competition. I don't. I don't watch anything like that. There's no point. I get enough sports in my life. Mm. What about yourself? Job. If you have like a killer episode, are I you might like, watch like if I do an on cam. That's mm-hmm. like I put some work into like that's funny i might watch it back just to see but usually after we do it they'll show it to me anyway um but i won't watch usually watch the whole show but sometimes when i do i'm like this is a pretty good show (laughs) (laughs) pretty damn good at this This is all right are uh are you a competitive person no not in this business because um i mean i guess i am i guess we're all competitive but i also have worked with literally everyone at my competition like everyone Behind the scenes and in front of the camera, I know all of them, and most of them are my friends. So, and the other thing is, our industry has shrunk so much that I'm not interested in other shows failing. I'm not interested in any competition show failing. I want more shows. I want more broadcasting to happen. So, I'm I'm just rah rah all around. You know, the yeah. the worst thing would be to to have the other guys, uh, you know, fail miserably. Yeah, that would be bad. Mike, you have to be out of here in uh, eight minutes, so let's get to this last topic. Okay. All right. Jeez. I'm producing. Well, now, wow, that's the great. Pocket. We got Jay. We're rolling. Max but Jay Kermit. also has a life to live, yeah. you know, errands to run. Um, our last topic today, guys, is uh, the Washington Nationals won the World Series. They went and visited the White House, and, of course, President Donald Trump uh, online. This caused a, a, a myriad of opinions, uh, pro and against 
one of the big things that came out of this was an image of uh, the Nationals catcher, Kurt Suzuki, uh, wearing a, a mega hat and being held from behind <laughs> by Donald Trump like they were on the bow of the fucking Titanic, uh, <laughs> which was entertaining in a lot of ways. But he he got a lot of blowback. Uh, the the image was, it was, it was striking. It, became, it went viral. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on visiting the White House just as a sort of traditional thing that uh, teams do? Is it antiquated? Do we need it? What's it all about? And then two... Uh, is it weird that it's become so politicized, obviously, with somebody um, as polarizing as Donald Trump? Who wants to take this mm. one, guys? Well, I, I love that the Warriors said no. I like that the NBA took an anti-Trump stance because I, I sort of align probably with my politics more in that lane. Um, but then... But like, then were you, you disappointed when the Penguins went? Well, a little bit. But then I was thinking, well, why do I need to be so partisan about this? Or why do... I why can't sports just be sports and they can just participate in this tradition like every other team has participated in this tradition. So but then you go, oh, but maybe Trump is especially egregious as a president and we should not be condoning him or flattering him on any level. And so I think like if it was any other president, Republican or Democrat, you just go. But there's something that's so singularly bad about Trump that mm -hmm. that you wish that some of these jocks would go. Yeah, fuck that. I'm not going to do it. We, in the way that the NBA players did. Yeah, putting the kids in the cages was a harsh move to support, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things. I think Max nailed it. I think it's uh, in the moment now, you, you're a bit disappointed when athletes go. But I think you have to think about it from a historical perspective. And you have to, if you're that athlete, I think you have to think beyond Trump. Mm. I think you have to, I think there might be some regret if you win one championship and then. 50 years later, you're an old man and you're like, why didn't I just go to the White House? Like, mm -hmm. why didn't I just go and show up? Like, it's a cool thing, right? It's a cool thing to go to the White House. It just is. Uh, even though he, he might be a douchebag, it's still cool. So I kind of think I'm good with with either thing. Uh, to me, the best thing is like Steven Strasburg the other day, uh, the Washington Nationals pitcher, got up, spoke, and then Trump went to shake his hand and he just walked away. Right. Like, that's oh, perfect, wow. right? Why not show up and then make the guy look bad if you really don't like him? That's, and Zimmerman that's went perfect. the other way, though, right? He yeah, was, Zimmerman he, was yeah. like, you know, because he's a veteran, yeah, I think mm -hmm. he felt like he had to, you know. So mm -hmm. if you won, you would go for sure? I think so. Yeah, okay. I just think I would feel like I'm not going to let this particular president, who I may or may not agree with, mm -hmm. affect whether or not I get to go visit the White House because I'm a champion in my particular sport. Would you shun him on the handshake? I think so. Yeah. Ooh, see, yeah. that, that's actually. Would kind you of the... do like the hand out and then through the hair? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Yeah, yeah, maybe go for a high five and then pull it back or something like that. Let's uh, say there's a photo op and everyone has to wear the mega hat for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now that I think about it, I always, because we just had Halloween, and I'm always looking for, like, easy costumes. Oh. Like, I should just go as Kurt Suzuki next year and just put right. on a bag. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, would you go? Uh, I'd probably I'd probably skip it just because I wouldn't want to be in the photo with Trump. Mm. And then in order to see the White House, I'd take, like, the pedestrian tour. Right. You know, I'd just go on the, the civilian tour at some point. I, I, I'd pass. I just wouldn't want to be in a photo, I, I don't think, with him uh, based on, you know, a plethora of things that, that have happened over the last three years. Uh, but I think uh, I think it's a personal choice, and I think that guys, like if Sid the Kid wants to go and he's not particularly a, a, a political guy, you know, and his owner obviously wants to go for a bunch of reasons and the team's going, mm -hmm. I don't think it makes Sid necessarily a bad guy. Maybe he's just a guy that doesn't think about these things too much. And you can't, did he, he went with the Penguins, yeah. right? I'm, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think, you know, most, very few, uh, I think a couple of the um, Washington Capitals, uh, like a couple of them who were black, did not go. They skipped it, absolutely. And um, But generally, uh, most of the hockey players have gone. And I think because that's a hockey is very much a don't stand out, just follow the herd kind yeah, of sport. Yeah, it's a culture, right? yeah. Yeah, that's I will the say culture of hockey. That's been one of the most disappointing things to me as a sports fan is like um, in a sport like football, uh, where there's more, probably 70% of the league's African Americans, right. uh, and their white teammates don't don't stand up in a public way. I think there's a responsibility for the white guys just to be like, no, I'm, I'm like, if, if my teammates have a real issue with this, yeah, I, I'm going to side with them for these social issues. That's fair. I think that's a fair point. I, I guess the the other thing about football that's tough is that football is so weird because there's no guarantee contracts. Mm. Uh, careers are like three years average. Yeah. So I kind of feel like in some ways, 
you know, and what's happening to Colin Kaepernick? Yeah, you don't want to sabotage example. yourself. You right. just don't want to be like that guy who's like Colin Kaepernick's his career, and suddenly mm-hmm. your three-year career is zero years. Yeah, um, that's true. You know, that's that's another side of it too. And, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's very complicated because it used to be such a almost something we didn't even think about. You know, like like now when we show these on our show these White House visits, and we'll make a comment like I, all of a sudden I'll get a bunch of stuff online to me so like, loaded. oh, why are you, you know, why are you talking about politics and I don't really care if you don't like Trump and I don't want to hear that from you, yeah. that kind of stuff. And I was like, whoa, okay, well, I was just making fun of the fact that he looked like Leo DiCaprio. <laughs> Did you, you know? do that joke on your show? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I guess a lot of people hit that joke. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But that, you know, for me, it's just what's funny. Like, I don't I don't care that much. I just want, if it's funny, I'm going to put it on. Yeah. Um, you know, same with the Strasburg thing and all that. Uh, uh, the Blues, the St. Louis Blues were there a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and he just butchered Alex Petrangelo's name, like just butchered <laughs> it. Like like Bill Clinton uh, called Steve Eiserman, Steve Eiserman. Mm. Uh, that's funny to me, and that's but that's not political. That's just someone, yeah. you know, that's just a White House staffer not giving him the proper pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. You, know? you actually kind of feel bad for him at that point. Um, so yeah, anyway, I, I, I just looking for the funny, but it is, again, online, you get that feedback that's like, whoa, I, I don't want this political stuff. Whereas before, White House visit on our show is just boring you know Mm -hmm. it's just a boring thing erica would you go to the white house yeah yeah i would go similar reasons as you guys i feel like it's historical that's all i have to say about that (laughs) and on that note no uh i guess (laughs) aren't you curious about me shane sorry you were asking uh shane would you go to the white house if you won a championship in one of the uh, major sports leagues? do you think i would yeah i do actually no I bow down to society, and I feel like it would not be a popular decision publicly <laughs> to do that. And I have a child now, and the kids in the cages really bothered me, seeing the, the kids clutching onto the cage and being like, Mommy. Oh, that's a positive note to end things. Wow. With. Yeah, we usually end on a hilarious Jeez. laugh. Maybe we'll, maybe well, I thought some of you would laugh. He laughed, realized <laughs> no one else was going to, and nipped it in the bud. <laughs> I, I just didn't know where you were going. Like, where, Was it a bit? or I'm going to have another donut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs>